Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How to Sell Korea, brought to you by the Korea Tourism Organization and Baxter Media. I'm Dan McDonald from Baxter and today is Tuesday, September 24th. Presenting for us today is Randy Snape, National Marketing Manager for the Korea Tourism Organization. Hi Randy, how are you today? Good, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. So just before we dive into it, I'd like to let all the viewers know that if you have any questions during this webinar, feel free to type them into the Q&A box, which is found in your Zoom toolbar, or the chat box, and those questions will be answered after the presentation has wrapped up. Also, if you have any problems hearing or seeing the presentation, just type a quick message into the chat box and I'll do my best to assist you. Okay, Randy, since you're already sharing your screen, you can start whenever you're ready. Great. Well, I want to start by thanking everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is different than our typical type of webinar. Normally when we do a webinar, we're doing a destination training. So what that entails is where to go, what, where to stay, what to eat, what to do, et cetera. Now I will include some of that for today's presentation, but one of the biggest things that's come up when we do presentations for agents uh, for Korea, we get a lot of questions about um, how, how clients or how to approach a client or uh, what type of packages they should be recommending or how to upsell them on the destination. So we thought we'd change things for this particular webinar and we'd do it more on how to sell the destination. So what type of approach to give? I mean, we all know that, uh, and we're going to be honest when it comes to a tourism board, when a de client comes forward and they say, you know, I, I want to go to Japan, they're not saying I want to go to Korea or I want to go to Thailand or I want to go to Vietnam. They already have their destination in mind. And typically that destination that they have in mind it will be in Asia, if they're looking at Asia, of course, but they're not going to be saying, I want to go to Korea right away. So we're trying to show you on how to upsell Korea as a destination. We feel that that's really important. Um, not only is it more commission for you, but it will also give value added, added to the client. I mean, we all know that, and it's the same thing as a tourism board. We're fighting with online tour operators the same way that you are. Uh, we have difficulties with clients. They say, oh, I can just go and book this myself. I can do this myself. Well, we're going to show you in today's presentation why Korea, your clients need you, uh, how you can give them that value added, and how you can continue to bring them back for not only Korea packages in the future, but additional packages as well, and just give them that little bit extra. Show them why an agent truly is needed for any type of travel. So we thought we'd start with our most common questions, uh, and this is one that I get all the time. The first one is, how do I position Korea? And when we're talking about positioning, we're meaning in the stopover sense. So like I mentioned earlier, first time that a client comes to you, they'll come and sit down, they'll say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to pretend I'm an agent here, and they're going to say, you know, Randy, I want to, uh, I want to go to China. Uh, I really want to see the Great Wall. And I've got 10 days vacation. And usually when you do this type of thing, um, the client will ask something along the lines of, uh, Normally when the client asks something like, I, I want to go to Korea for, or I want to go to China, for example, to see the Great Wall of China, they're looking for a specific time frame. So they'll say they have seven days or they have a certain budget in mind. Now that budget always is a little bit flexible. We all know that. And the number of days that are out there also is something that's a little bit flexible. They say they've got, or they've got 10 days, but maybe that package that you're promoting to them is seven. You haven't found a way to truly maximize the amount of vacation time that they actually have. So one of the things you can look at is accessibility. This is not just for Korea, but you can look at our direct flights with Korean Air and Air Canada, but also the other destinations within Asia that Korea can connect to. So if you look at our second slide here, you'll see all the different uh, options for connecting flights in Korea. Now, personally, I know you're thinking, oh, come on, Australia, really? Yeah, actually, when I've done a number of my fam trips, I've seen a number of clients, I've met a number of people that are actually connecting in Seoul to go down to Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, it's just the connectivity for, their Air, um, for Air Canada to get into Seoul is the cheapest flight that was available for them. Uh, but some of the other options, of course, Beijing, you can see that it's just a two-hour flight. Japan is also a great combination with Korea. So look at that stopover. Try and push them into doing an extra three days. Remember what I said, you, that package that you're going to book for them is seven days in length. You just want to add three more days. They've already told you that they have 10 days. So you, uh, what you want to do is add that second land portion to it. Combine it with the air. They're going to have to stop somewhere in Northeast Asia if they're looking at other destinations as well. So, for example, if they're going to Thailand, a lot of you out there have sold Thailand before, perhaps Malaysia or Singapore. There are no direct flights from Canada. So you need to be able to find something to combine it with. Korea is the perfect stopover for that. Typically, a stopover runs anywhere from two to five nights in length. But remember those tour operators, and I'll get to that a little bit later, who's selling Korea in Canada. 
you can um, add or customize anything. So if you're already buying for, and I'm just going to give an example here, let's suppose that you're buying a, a GoWay product for Thailand. You, GoWay also sells a Korea package and they, their typical Thailand package, let's say is eight days in length. Well, you can still got an extra two days that you can add to that, upsell them on the flights through Korea. More than likely, they're going to be on a Korean air flight anyway. If they're connecting in Asia via a different carrier, more than likely it's going to be an Air Canada through Seoul as well. It's a very popular stopover hub. Uh, just a quick fact check for everyone out there. We actually had around 190,000, 194,000 Canadians that visited Korea last year. But from our estimation of all the people that we visited, that we approached at travel shows, et cetera, a lo very large number of those are coming from stopovers. They've done so on the way to another destination. And we know that that number is very small compared to perhaps some of the other destinations out there, but we are a growth destination. If you look at the Canadian arrivals to Korea in the last, let's say, 20, 25 years, there are very few years where we have had a negative growth year. And most of the time, our growth is between 8 and 10%. Uh, a healthy growth, of course, being 5%. But we typically have very good years. We're expecting more than 200,000 Canadians to do the same thing again this year. Some of the other questions we get, if my client wants to go to China but is concerned about a visa, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of people that have sold China in the past, now you have to visit the consulate or visit the embassy yourselves to go and get a visa. Well, or again, combine them. First thing you want to do is tell them about Korea. When it comes to history, typically that's why they're visiting China. They want to experience the history. They want to see the Great Wall. They want to see UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Korea has all of those as well. But the most important thing to mention is visas. Uh, there are, I will mention Americans in a minute, but for Canadian passport holders, there is no visa required for up to 180 days. This is a very common question that we get. Well, what's the visa process? There isn't one. As long as you can show that you have an outgoing ticket, so that means you're leaving the country within 180 days of entering. Uh, there's no visa required. It's granted at the airport. They don't even stamp your passport anymore. They little put a little piece of paper in there stating this is your visa. This is how long it's valid for. There's no additional cost for it. This is just something you receive. Uh, for American passport holders, because there are some people out there that may uh, sell to Americans as well, you're looking at a maximum of three months, so 90 days. So we actually have up to six months. It's the only country that Korea has an agreement uh, with that allows up to six months in the country with no visa required. Another one we get is quite common. My client wants to go to UNESCO or to see UNESCO in China. How can I upsell them on that package? Well, remember what I said before, that seven day package, that eight day package, they already told you how many days. So that's a good leading question when your client first sits down. I want to go to China, here's my budget. Um, well, you ask them, how many days do you have? Look at those smaller number of days for that destination. For example, let's suppose that at that $3,000 package for an eight day tour of China and they told you they have 12 days. Well, they might have a budget or they might be willing to spend another 1,000, 1,500, somewhere in that range for a stopover in Seoul. Remember, they're going to be stopping somewhere in Northeast Asia, and this doesn't apply to just China. It can be anywhere. They're going to be stopping somewhere in Northeast Asia. Now, we do have direct flights from China, but uh, are from Canada that go to China as well, but they're an easy combination. There are a lot of low-cost carriers that connect China and Korea, and it's very easy. You can have them doing, uh, let's suppose, Toronto to Shanghai, Shanghai to Incheon via one of those low-cost carriers, and then again from Incheon back to Toronto. And they can do that via Korean Air, um, just out of the Korea portion, but they can also do it with Air Canada. So those are another, some other options out there for you. Uh, but for the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, no, we don't have 44. That's the number that I currently understand that China has, but Korea has a number 13 World Natural or Cultural Heritage Sites in Korea. And we have one natural world heritage site, which we'll get to in a little bit. But just to give you an idea, there is a lot to see. Now, there are four in Seoul in the surrounding area of just UNESCO World Heritage Sites to take a look at. So if your client is going to Asia for that culture and they've got a couple of days, and the reason that they're going to China or they're going to Japan is they, they're interested in history, they're interested in UNESCO, pair it up with something like this. Tell them that their, Korea has UNESCO World Heritage Sites as well. Uh, some of those sites, for example, now, there are five palaces in Seoul, but there's actually only one palace of the five that is a, is a certified UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, this particular palace is actually one of the favorites of kings and queens of Korea's past, so the royalty of Korea's past. And the reason that it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site is there's actually a secret garden that is in the back. The only way to do this is part of an organized tour. Well, that's where they need you. So if you're buying, for example, from... Um, 
example, we'll just say this time around that you're buying from a company called Trip Connoisseurs. They customize packages for Korea and all over the world. If they're going to arrange a package for you, for your clients, and they're customizing it, they may include this UNESCO World Heritage Site. They'll be sure that your clients are getting in there during one of those escorted tour times. Uh, now, if your client tries to do this on their own, they're going to show up at one o'clock in the afternoon, and of course, the tours may be done on that particular day. So that means they'll never get to see the secret garden. Again, another reason that they need you. Some other examples of UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the Sokram uh, the Grotto, this sits on the mountainside, actually. If you've got a client that does go or is interested in UNESCO, this sits uh, very close to one of the major temples in Korea, but ask your client tell them to get the story from the guide about the diamond that is missing from the Buddha statue's head. This is a very interesting story. Uh, another question that we often get, if my client wants to go to Japan for cherry blossoms, but find it expensive, where else can I recommend? Uh, that's one option that we've gotten as questions. Another one is um, perhaps your client is just looking to explore cherry blossoms in Japan and they're looking to go during the spring. Don't be afraid to combine it. They've already told you that they want to go for the cherry blossoms. There is more than just Japan that has cherry blossoms. Korea has a number of them as well. Uh, so giving you some examples of some of that scenery that you see in the background there. Very popular time of year for Koreans to travel, uh, especially for foreigners or foreign tourists to visit Korea, is during the cherry blossom season. And combining Korea and Japan really helps with that. Remember that $3,000 package at that 10% commission, which is standard for most tour operators in Canada. Now, so let's suppose that's $300 in your pocket, but you've just, addition, just sold them on an additional $1,500 stopover package. There's an additional $150 in your pocket just by recommending this one if they're sold on the idea. Four seasons, we do have four very distinct seasons. So it's not just a matter of the cherry blossoms. That could be one thing that they're after. Korea has very much like um, many other Asian destinations, very, four very crisp and clean seasons. And what I mean by that is it's a typical three months. So you have a three month warm up to the summer. The summer is very hot and humid, like much of Asia. And they have, of course, beach destinations within that. Then you get to the fall and you have so that crisp, clean weather. You get a good, uh, I want to say, month or so with a, a changing of the leaves toward the, uh, the beginning to mid of the fall. And then, of course, your winters. And yes, there is snow when it comes to Korea. Of course, those who remember the 2018 Winter Olympics, they were held just east of Seoul. So again, there's a lot of snow to be had in the eastern provinces. It's a great place for adventure. So for those who are interested in skiing, they want to try something new, they perhaps have been to somewhere in Asia, look at Korea. They have a number of ski uh, resorts throughout the country. Just an example of some of those hills. And of course, one of my favorites, uh, this actually is festivals. So some other festivals other than cherry blossoms that are out there, this is a ice fishing festival. But some other ones that are out there, you've got uh, the Mud Festival. This is popular for the younger demographic. Uh, it's a very big party that lasts about two weeks, and everything is mud. Mud themed, mud baths, mud soaps, uh, the, everything is mud surrounding. Uh, another one is the Lantern Festival. Um, for the Lantern Festival, this is one that you see outside of Seoul, um, or uh, sorry, in Seoul as well. It's a very popular one for international travelers to go and visit. This is held sometimes uh, around the Buddha's birthday. And then the ice festival. So we have festivals, we have more than 200 different festivals that take place per year. That's a, that's a really important one. So regardless of the time of year that your clients are visiting, there is certainly a festival for them. Now I'm gonna warn you in advance, not all of them are as unique as the ones you see here. Um, some of them are very food focused, like tofu they have a tofu festival so it all depends on the area that they're visiting as well but there's a festival for just about anything and everything in korea another one is your client is traveling to vietnam and you've done your best to sell them on a stopover but your client says no they don't have the time or perhaps they don't have a budget remember there are no direct flights from canada to vietnam so how are they going to get there that's an important one um, the free transit tour the same thing uh, so take a look at the free transit tours that Incheon International Airport offers. This is a really important one. If your client has told you no on the stopover, you've already tried, they say no, that they, uh, they can't afford it or they don't have the time, etc. then look at a free transit tour. They're bookable free of charge on Incheon International Airport's website. They vary in length from one to six hours. Now, typically when it comes to consumers, this is not something that Korea Tourism Organization in Canada that we advertise to the public. This is something that we give directly to agents. We think that this is important for you because you're giving that value added to the client. 
there's two reasons for that. One, you're giving the value out of the client. So let's suppose that you tried to sell them on the stopover. They say, no, uh, they don't have the time. They don't have the money, et cetera. So then you've told them about this and it's just, just a second, a little technical difficulty. No worries. There we go. I think that's a little bit better. So the free transit tours, you've tried to sell them on it. They've said no, that they're not able to um, uh, upsell on that particular package uh, and they, they're not interested. So you've given them the free transit tour option. They, and because they're going to be stopping somewhere in Northeast Asia and they've already sold on or tried to sell them on the Korea, well, you say, why don't we route you through Korea? Sometimes that actually might be cheaper for you, especially with Korean air flights or sometimes with connection with Air Canada and a different carrier. Uh, they're going to be spending some time in a layover. So it gives them a free transit tour. So everything from uh, entertainment um, or a temple, they go and visit a temple in, in just outside of Incheon, just outside of the airport. Some of them are one hours in length. They vary for in length from one to six hours. But it gets them outside of the airport. It gets them to see a different destination. That's really important as well. Um, but the most important thing is they didn't think of it on their own. They got to add a second destination, so they feel like they've seen a lot more during their trip. And the next time, they're going to come back to you because you're the one that recommended it to them in the first place. And the best thing is it didn't cost you anything to do it. All you had to do was mention it. It's easy for them to book, or you can do it for them on Incheon's airport's website. So very easy to do. Uh, the second reason that we think that free transit tours is really, really important is that it gives us the opportunity to show the client a new destination that they haven't visited before. So let's suppose that they go and do that five hour tour or they go and do the six hour shopping tour, for example. They got to see downtown Seoul. They thought, wow, I really want to come back. And the next vacation they take, we're hoping that they're going to choose Korea. A lot of times that we've actually seen this follow through, clients have decided that the next time that they visit Asia, they're going to combine Korea with that second destination and they're going to book a stopover for this time. Now, again, who is the person that recommended that? That's you. So they're going to come back to you because you're the one that knows the destination. You know about the free transit tours. Very easy. Everything's on the website. Very easy to take a look at. Uh, my client has done much of Asia. It isn't sure what makes Korea special. Uh, so this comes down to a matter of, I, I want to say, symbols of the country. So when most people, and I'm just going to give a quick quiz. I know it's very difficult for those out there to answer. I'm not going to ask you to answer in the chat or anything like that. But just when I say China, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? More than likely in terms of destinations, you're thinking the Great Wall of China, right? Or when I say Japan, for example, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you visit Japan? Sushi, right? Or... Um, temples or there's a lot that or cherry blossom season for a lot of Canadians those are the things that come forward so why Korea what's different what does Korea have what makes it special so that's an important one as well and a lot of clients don't know much about the destination this is really that undiscovered gem remember what I told you before this is a growth destination so there's a lot of opportunity there for you uh, first one is the DMZ we always like to address the elephants in the room our noisy northerly neighbors uh, this is one of the world's most dangerous borders. Now, you're probably thinking, why are you recommending this? Well, actually, it is probably the, one of the safest places to be because of the fact that there has never been an incident with a tourist when it comes to the DMZ. Never, not once in the number of years that they've been holding uh, DMZ tours. And it's also your client's unique look inside of North Korea. So if you see that building on the left, actually, that's one uh, during the tour, the JSA tour, so the Joint Security Area, they actually take you into the room and you'll pass a large boardroom-like table that has a number of microphones on it that sit in the middle of the table. So they wait till they get their group of 15 or 20 people in there. And they, of course, it's a smaller room, right? So they push everybody and they get about, uh, let's suppose there's 20 people in there, but 15 of them will be sitting on the other side of those microphones. And then the guide announced, congratulations, you are now in North Korea. There's no line on the floor or anything like that. This is where a lot of those negotiations or face-to-face -face meetings can take place. Uh, of course, there is an MP standing on the door on the north side so that uh, nobody from the south tries to escape to the north or vice versa. But uh, it, it's an interesting way to go and look at uh, the DMZ. For those who aren't familiar with the Korean War, this is just in a brief nutshell what happened. So at the end of the uh, 1945, the end of the Second World War, uh, Korea was divided into two. How that was done is they said, well, Japan had surrendered. At that time, Japan was a colony of, or sorry, Korea was a colony of Japan. So Japan had surrendered. 
in which case Russia or the USSR took the north and the United States took the south and they decided, okay, we're going to hold elections, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that didn't last long. Everybody knows how, what happened in 1950 and that war lasted for three years. Remember that they divided in 1945 across that 38th parallel. This is after three years of war. There's a 38th parallel, you see, and there's a number of tunnels that are marked there as well. We'll get to that in a second. But they actually divided it across that line, and after three years of war, it's pretty much at the same place. There wasn't a clear winner between the North and the South Pavilion. Instead, it's, uh, it's truly a sad war. But this is another thing that uh, really sets Korea apart. It is the only divided country on Earth. There is no other divided country out there. The only divided country on Earth. It is one country not two, and that's something that's often misunderstood, but it is the only one that's out there that is divided. Uh, we do have a number of infiltration tunnels that are part of the tour as well, depending on which tour you take. So this is your chance to get to see how this, the North had planned after and during the war to s launch not only a second assault, but of what they were planning to use for the initial assault to get into the South. So they had dunk, dug a number of holes from the North into the South. Uh, some of them were able to accommodate up to 60,000 troops per hour. So this is that DMZ line. You see that large cement pillar or uh, barrier underneath the, uh, the leader uh, on the right. This is the current president of South Korea and, of course, the, uh, the leader of the north. This was one of the meetings that took place late, late last year. This is one of the only times that such a thing had taken place. So it's uh, a warming of tensions is what we're experiencing right now. Don't believe everything that you hear in the media. Remember that anything that North Korea does gains attention, and there's a reason that they do that. Uh, take a look at our images. We see on the bottom, and this is a unique one. This is one of the lookout points on the bottom two images, uh, lookout points into North Korea. You'll notice those mountains in the background are pretty barren. The reason for that is uh, it, they typically use the trees that were on that, those mountains for firewood during the winter times. Um, again, it's just a very poor country. It's, uh, things have developed quite a bit, but this is the way things used to be. They were that far underdeveloped. Uh, we all offer, of course, a number of other unique experiences as well. So these are some important ones. Your clients are looking for something different. We do offer a lot of different experiences. So some of those examples are the humble wearing experience. So you get to try on a traditional Korean clothing, for example. So you can see the ladies in the top left-hand corner. Now, my favorite thing to do when I go and do the humble experience is I will put on the king's uh, costume, of course, or the king's humble, and then I'll go walk along the palace grounds. So I'll go and see my territory and my kingdom. Uh, there's a number of pictures online of me doing that. Uh, for the younger demographic, for those who are interested in K-pop or Korean pop music, uh, they get their own recording. So that's a very popular one as well. So they get to go and take their recording home with them. Uh, another one is traditional rice wine making. So they get to make their own uh, makoli is one example. Uh, not necessarily soju, but they have tasting experiences for that too. That's a really popular one. One of my favorite things for this one is they have, um, they used to start with a paste. And this is actually something that they had served hundreds of years ago. And the reason that the liquor was actually in a paste format was it was rude to use someone else's washroom when you went to their house. So you would go to their house, of course. You would be offered a drink. But in those days, they didn't offer a drink. And it was very complicated for a lady to remove her humble in order to use the washroom. So that's why they had pastes in those days. You wouldn't need to use them. But it's just a very different experience. They walk you through um, uh, a few of the experiences actually offer uh, everything from 7% that goes up to 75% the alcohol content of it. Um, and they do offer a number of different experiences, everything from making to tasting. But what's unique about it is some of them are actually taught by uh, people that have been certified by the government uh, for rice wine making, and they've had it in their family for more than four or five generations, depending on who you go to. And last but not least, our cooking classes or kimchi making classes. These are popular ones too. One of my favorite things about going to do one of these, and I always try and request a new recipe each and every time that I go to the kimchi making classes, or I should say the cooking classes, because you can take those recipes home with you. Really, really popular thing to do. Uh, my next one, my client is looking for some unique stays. So maybe your client has been to Vietnam and they've done a homestay, or maybe they've done Japan and they've tried the same thing. Well, something different that uh, clients or that Korea has to offer is, of course, temple stays. So this is, or I should say, sorry, Hanok stays. Hanok stay is a traditional Korean uh, house stay. So you spend one night in their house. Now that you walk in the main doors, just like I showed you in the previous slide, 
uh, and it's, you open it up into a courtyard, and the rooms are all around the outside of the courtyard. Now, sometimes when you rent a hanok, it is part of, you're just renting a room in a hanok. Sometimes it's the entire house. It all depends on the number of people that you have or the company that you're booking with. So be sure to mention that. Uh, they do sleep on the floor, so you see in the bottom right-hand corner, but it's a very thick mattress that they use. They call it a yo. It's almost like a super thick comforter, and sometimes they'll even put down two of them, depending on how comfortable or uncomfortable you might be. The heating is all done through the floors in Korea. So they run copper pipes that run through the floors that have hot water that are running through those pipes that, of course, heats the floors, which heats the rest of the house. And with most hanok stays, they offer a meal as well. So a traditional Korean meal, you can see from the top right-hand corner. So something different for those clients. I mean, most people can say, yes, I've stayed in uh, the Park Hyatt, or I've stayed in the Astoria, or I've stayed in this five-star or that five-star. But how many people can actually say this? say they stayed in a traditional Korean home. So something different. Uh, temple stays are another one. I briefly talked about that one. This one is a truly unique experience. Now I warn you, this is not for everyone. This is for that true adventure seeker. And here is why. Uh, your check-in time is around 4, 3 to 4 p.m. And what happens when you check in is you're given a set of clothing like you see in the bottom left-hand corner. So you dress just as the monks do. Now there are temples throughout the country that offer the unique uh, temple stay experience but they're throughout the country. Um, and some of them are mountainside, some of them are um, oceanside, some of them are in the middle of the city. It all depends on which area you book for. But they go to bed very early. You do have chores that are required of you. When it comes to the food, you are expected to finish every last grain of rice. They don't waste anything. Remember the Buddhist concept of emptiness is fulfillness, right? So that's why they even take water They'll put it in the rice bowl to rinse out all those little last grains of rice to make sure you clean it right out. 100% vegetarian, of course, um, but why that a lot of people have, uh, I shouldn't say it's not for everyone, is probably the best way to describe this, is when you wake up in the morning and you are sleeping on the floor on a very thin yo, but it is heated, don't worry, it's, the floors are still heated, you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning. The reason you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning is they want you to be able to truly experience the Korean Buddhist lifestyle. So they're up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they do 108 bows. Um, again, very difficult for some people to be able to get up and do that, but it's a unique stay. It's something different. Uh, there are only a few tour operators in Canada that do offer this, but they're very popular items. Just remember that when you're recommending this for the client, do let them know that they are sleeping on the floor. They do have to wear that traditional Korean clothes or the traditional Korean monk garb as well as they do have to do those 108 bows. Now there, of course, there is some understanding, you know, if you can't go through with it on your own, but it's a very unique stay, something different. Uh, this one we've been getting a little bit more recent. My client wants to go to Japan, China for the Olympics. With the Olympics up and coming, people are starting to plan 2020 and beyond. So we talked about combining the two destinations. Remember how close the two destinations are. First one, Japan. Two and a half hour flight is your max to just about anywhere in Japan. Uh, about a two hour to three and a half hour flight going to China. There are actually ferries that connect both um, Korea and Japan, depending on the destination you go to. One right off the bat is Fukuoka. There is a ferry that goes across. It's about four and a half, five hours in length. Uh, but it's very easy to combine the two destinations. Very easy on that upsell. And if you do have a client that ha is looking for something like that, reach out to some of those tour operators or myself. I'd be happy to help with planning that itinerary for you. It makes it a little bit easier. What are some of the recommended places for my clients to go in Korea? Uh, this one breaks it down into three cities. And you'll notice when I do this particular part that I won't be doing it um, with the official Korean names. The reason for that is I know that tomorrow you're going to forget that. That's going to be very difficult. So I'm going to give it the nicknames and that's going to be the easiest thing for you to remember. Uh, so we're going to start with first uh, a map of Korea so you can take a look at all the different things that or the different cities within the country and some of the things that they're famous for. If you were to move from, for example, Incheon in the top left hand corner to go all the way down to the bottom left or the bottom right hand corner of Busan. So you're starting in the top left going to the bottom right. It's a very small country only looking at about five and a half hours in length. So it's really not long or not hard to get there. Uh, one of the most popular ways to do so is, of course, via the KTX, but there are buses that run as well. The KTX would cut that travel time down to just over two hours in length. Uh, if you're looking at Seoul, uh, this is a big hint. Makes it easy for booking. When you're looking at hotels, make sure that you're booking 
north of the Han River, especially for clients that are looking for something to be able to go out and do at night on their own. Every client loves to have that escorted tour where they have their guide or perhaps their privately guided tour, but they want to be able to get out at night and see something. So some of the areas that you want to look at are the ones that are marked in green. <clears throat> but to be honest, anything that is north of that Han River, and that's a really dividing point, it makes it very easy to go some, you see some of those sites. So whether it be shopping or the tower or uh, one of the palaces, it just makes it very, very simple to get around because it's all within walking distance. So our first one is the Grand Palace. This is the largest palace of the five. This is not a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of much of it was rebuilt. Um, but this is one thing that your clients are going to want to visit because they have the changing of the guard ceremony that takes place every day at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Again, how are their clients going to know unless they do a tremendous amount of research, but all those tour operators that sell Korea in Canada, they all know and they'll make sure that this is a part of their plan. There's some of those changing of the guard ceremonies as well. You see the uh, picture on the top. There's a night view at the bottom. Uh, right next door is actually a very traditional area called Bukchun. So this is the Hanok village. So those traditional Korean house villages. Uh, this village is only open six days a week and only be in daylight hours. I think it's from 10 until 6 p.m. The reason for that is all of these people still live there. There are a number of people that still live in this area. Now, Hanok stays are possible or traditional Korean homestays are possible in this area, but they ask that you be very quiet. Use whispered voices when you're walking through. It's a very popular tourist spot to go and take pictures, especially if you're wearing a hanbok, so that traditional Korean clothing. You go and walk around, but um, it just because of the number of tourists that are in there, they ask you to be very quiet when you're going through because people are still living within the area. Uh, our next picture, again, just an example of the Hamburg, so people dressed in tra traditional Korean clothing and walking around. In Insadong, so this is our next stop. This one is traditional handicrafts. So this one is where your client's going to find that little piece of Korea to bring home with them. It's about a 700 meter long street and they have a number of different shops, everything selling from hand fans to masks to um, uh, lotus lanterns to one of my favorite buys to go from this particular area is uh, little nightside table lamps that are all made with Korean rice paper. So there's lots of little goodies to be found in here, but usually part of their tours to go and visit this particular area. So remember that antique alley is one nickname for it or where they're going to find that little souvenir. This is typically where they're going to find it. They also have a number of different food and shops, etc. that are in the area. Uh, some great street food too. One of the newest attractions, this is the fifth largest building in the world. This is Lotte World Tower. So it sits at 555 meters in, uh, in uh, height. Uh, and there is an observation tower that sits at the very top of the building. So this one is a fantastic viewpoint. This is kind of sits opposite. A lot of uh, tour operators in Canada used to do the Seoul Tower. Now they're doing the Lotte World Tower. It's very beautiful at night because you get to see all the, um, the lights, especially in the spring and fall when you have that nice, crisp, clean air. There's another lookout point. Uh, now there is a humble experience in the base of this particular tower. There are two ways to get to the top of this one. And this is something you're going to tell your clients about. Uh, the reason I say you're going to want to tell your clients about this because it'll show that you have knowledge of the area. Seoul Tower, there is a cable car that runs from the bottom of the mountain to the base of the tower. Now, not every tour group takes the cable car. What most of them do is they say, oh, yeah, we'll get a bus to the top. Well, the bus doesn't actually go all the way to the top. There's still about a 150 meter section along the side of it where you need to walk up a very steep hill. So for those who have elderly clients, this is not going to be possible for them. So make sure that you mention this to them. Oh, well, do you want to walk up the mountain? Um, there's about a 150 meter section or so. It's a steep hill. Or would you prefer to take the cable car? So there are a number of options for them there. Just make sure you ask them in advance. Just a little bit of a hint. Uh, some of the love locks, so everybody's seen that and when it comes to France, well, they do the same thing in Korea. We do ask that if you're going to go and do one of the love locks, so you write, you know, Randy plus whoever on the particular lock, and you write it magic marker, and then you lock the key, or you, I'm sorry, you lock the lock onto one of the other locks or onto the fence that's there, and you throw the key over, make sure you're palming the key. Don't actually throw the key over because they're trying to, it is a national park that the, uh, the soil tower sits on. They want to make sure that... Um, not too many keys are being thrown over. They want to make sure that it remains clean. So we're going to move to the second largest city. 
Uh, this city, the city's name is Busan. You may have heard of it for those who have not. This is kind of like the Vancouver of Korea. It's the second largest city. It's a very coastal city. Um, it's one of the large, or it is the largest port city for Korea. So for anybody out there who has a Samsung or a Kia or drives a, uh, let's suppose a, a Hyundai car, it's all coming out of this particular port. But there's a number of other things. It's not just an industrial port. It's a beautiful beach destination as well. Uh, here's an example of some of the areas that you can visit. Uh, a lot of little coffee shops in here. There's also a lot of little, um, sh uh, not just coffee shops, but the antique or souvenir shops that are in the area. Just a beautiful collage of colors. There is a Buddhist temple that sits seaside, one of the only ones in Korea here. And of course, the seafood market. This is a really popular one as well. Uh, this seafood market is about 800 meters in length. And on the, this is what you see on the left and the right side. But on the right side, there's actually a number of buildings. And on the second floor of most of those buildings, it's an all-you-can-eat seafood restaurant. So the different types of seafood you can see from here. A Little bit of everything. Now, I hope everybody's had lunch for our next slide. Um, the reason for that is this is one of the most recommended foods to be tried by international tourists on a recent survey, take, a survey that was taken last year. So remember, this is international tourists that I recommend. This is a must try food. So here we go. This is live squid. Um, I've tried it myself. Very, very good. I really enjoyed it. But it's not, uh, it's not for everyone. Just uh, if your clients are looking for something different, they're adventurous, tell them to try the live squid, something new. What is the best Korean cuisine? Uh, this kind of runs along the same lines of why are Korean women golfers so good? I'm sorry, I can't answer that one. That's more a matter of preference when it comes to cuisine. It's a very difficult question, but we have a lot of different types of food. Probably the easiest way to describe um, Korean food is if it's red, it's spicy. That's, uh, it pretty ho holds pretty standard for most Korean foods but there are a number of different types of kimchi as well. So that's that dish that you see there in the middle. So you'll probably recognize some of the dishes that are here, but one of the ones that we want to highlight for you is, of course, in the top left-hand corner. A lot of clients are asking about, and we get a lot of clients nowadays that are saying about um, allergies to food. That's an important one. Also, some other things other than just allergies to food would be um, uh, vegetarian. They might be vegetarian. So one of the things that you can do upon arrival at the airport, they're going to be greeted by their guide, of course, because you're going to be booking something for them. Just make sure that they write down on the back of the a back of a business card, for example, that they are allergic, what they're allergic to, or that they are vegetarian. And each restaurant will be sure to uh, recommend a few dishes that they would be able to serve that would be within your client's palate. What is the currency used and are credit cards accepted? This is a very common one. So the currency used is won. Now I have a number of Canadian clients that visit Korea and they all bring US dollars. I guess most Canadians are under the assumption that we can't take Canadian dollars to Korea and accept them right or, and uh, exchange them right away. We need US dollars. Uh, that's actually not true. You can bring Canadian dollars and they can be exchanged anywhere. Um, in terms of the best place to exchange it, Number one, of course, is the money changers in Yongdong. So that's a shopping district. We'll talk a little, a little bit later. Um, but the number two would be, of course, banks in Korea. Remember, they're only open during banking hours. And Canadian dollars are fully exchangeable. You don't need to do it to US dollars first. Uh, third would be the airport in Korea. Again, not as good as the rates that you would receive at the banks in Korea, but still very good. And of course, fourth and last place would be anywhere that you buy Korean won in Canada. Uh, they put a pretty heavy premium on that. But credit cards are also widely accepted for any major name variants. Here's the, the big difference though. When you're looking in Korea uh, and you're going to go shopping, let's suppose you walk into a Ma and Pa souvenir shop. Not all of them can afford to put a 5% transaction fee on the credit card that you're paying with. So they'll prefer cash. So a lot of Korean society is still very cash focused that way. But if anytime you're paying for a hotel, a coffee at a coffee shop, um, uh, a, perhaps a meal at a big restaurant, that type of thing, you'll notice that the, uh, they do accept credit cards. You can also pull Korean won straight off your debit card. You'll see in the bottom right-hand corner or off your credit card, foreign card English, so that top left-hand corner that you see in the bottom right-hand corner, the top left-hand corner button, makes it very easy for clients to get around. And everything is in English there as well.
how can my client travel around Korea? This is more for, you know, your client gets off a tour at night, they're looking for something to do. Where should they go? What should they see? They, they've heard a couple of recommendations about some shopping places that they'd like to go and check out, like traditional markets, et cetera. Easiest way is Subway. You're probably thinking, oh, very overwhelming. But I assure you that everything is in English, truly everything. And as long as you're north of the river, so here's that Han River that you see all the way here following the mouse. As long as you're sitting north of the river, many of those places will be within walking distance, but if they're not, they can always go and take the subway. Uh, every line is color coded as well as numbered and each subway station is also numbered and uh, has given an English name to it. So it makes it very easy to get around. Now, for those who are from outside of uh, Toronto, so for example, if you're from Vancouver, everybody has this pretty much within the Canadian transportation system now. It's like a tappable card that they can tap on when they get on the subway or a bus or subway, et cetera, and this, or a train, and then they do the same thing when they get off. They've had this technology in Korea for about 25 years now. Um, they've gotten rid of subway tickets. Those were long gone, I think about 15 years ago now. So it's a very popular um, way to get around the city. and It's very easy to get around as well. But for those who are still too shy to give it a try, uh, take a look at the bottom right-hand corner. These are foreign-only taxis. It'll say right on it, foreigners only. What they mean is it's for tourists only. The drivers are guaranteed to speak English, and they'll know all the tourist hotspots. And most importantly, they'll be standing or waiting outside of those tourist hotspots as well. A uh, very popular question that we get, is English widely spoken in Korea? Yes, uh, it, but it all depends on where. And this is why they're going to need you for this one. In Seoul, very easy to go around with just English. All the street signs are in English. All your subway signs are in English, as well as most of the rest of the country as well. Uh, but as soon as you move, start to move away from Seoul, the actual capital, it gets more and more complicated. Um, so if, let's suppose that you're going down to an area in Jeonju or Jeollanam-do, these two provinces, not as easy. Now, there are certainly plenty of English signs, etc. It's just the confidence level of Koreans when they're speaking English is not nearly as high. Another one is, is Korea safe? Yes, very safe country. I'll give you an example. I lived in Korea for eight years. In the eight years that I was there, I had more problems in Canada in my entire life than I ever had in Korea. It's still very much one of those destinations where let's suppose that you were to leave your cell phone on the table in a restaurant. One of three things would either happen. And I'll give you a personal story in a minute. Uh, story number one or situation number one is the somebody from the restaurants or a waitress, waiter, et cetera, would chase you down the street and say, oh, you've forgotten your cell phone. You've forgotten your cell phone. Oh, great, thank you. Two, uh, you might go back an hour later and, oh, I might have forgot my cell phone here. They'll open it up and they'll take it out of the drawer and pass it to you. Uh, three, this is a personal one. I always had an extra cell phone for when friends or family visited me when I was in Korea. So uh, I guess I was, I want to say about three months after visiting Busan with a friend. Um, so this is that Vancouver of Korea City. Uh, what had happened was, I, I got a package in the mail one day from the police office and I thought, why is the Busan police sending me a package? Didn't understand. I had to sign for it and everything and they had paid something like $6 to send it up to me, registered mail and I, uh, the whole bit. But I opened it up and it's a cell phone that my friend had lost. I didn't even know that I had lost it. I didn't even think to get it back from him, but he had actually left it in his hotel room or left it in a restaurant. We don't even actually know where. And somebody had turned it into the police. They had researched who the owner of the phone was and mailed it to my address. Again, just very honest people throughout makes it very easy. Uh, that being said, though, it's not one of those destinations where you're going to want to walk down a dark alley, for example. Same thing with Toronto, as safe as Toronto can be or Vancouver can be. It, just those, there's certain places that you want to avoid. Use your common sense. That's the best way to uh, describe it. Don't be walking down any dark alleys at night. Um, as the lit popular tourist areas, you should be okay. And pickpockets, yes, it does happen but it's majorly tourist areas. You want to make sure that you keep everything close to yourself, but it's very rare that we run into any instances like this. My client wants to go for a wellness retreat. What can they do in Korea? This is a new popular thing to do in Korea. So the one thing that I'm going to mention for today, but there's another other number of other options that are available. First one is the Jimjilbang or the Korean saunas. Um, very popular place to be. One of the reasons that I like going here is because they have hot rooms, they have cold rooms, they have hot tubs at different temperatures, just very, very relaxing place. This is something that Koreans have done for many, many years. Uh, usually you go as a family, you can go and get a massage, they can, um, they can scrub all the dead skin off your body. It's, uh, it's a day event. Uh, some of the places you can actually stay overnight as well. 
Uh, but some other ones, they've got the tea therapy ones. They have those that are infused with oriental medicine. Um, it all depends on the type of experience that your clients are looking for. So if you know that your clients are into a different type of, uh, or they like to try a different type of massage, or if they'd like to try um, oriental medicine, or if they'd like to try something different, find out what that is and recommend it to the tour operator so they can customize that package for you and give your client that different experience. Where can my client go shopping in Korea? This kind of fits in with popular buys, and this is a common question that we get as well. So Myeongdong, the best way to describe this one is the cosmetics market. Uh, very popular buy here is cosmetics, especially Korean face masks. For anybody out there that uh, knows what BB cream is or CC cream, again, this is all rooted from Korea, right? This is where it came from. Uh, but the cosmetics market is a very popular place to go, and people will go in and buy ma face masks at like anywhere from 50 cents to 70 cents a piece, and the more you buy, the cheaper the price will be. There's underground shopping centers everywhere. So it's not just the express bus terminal that you see in the top right. They're a little bit of everywhere. Uh, everybody gets a little bit of jet lag. So look at the bottom left-hand corner. You get the same thing, Hongdae Moon Market. So this is the midnight market. This one is almost open 24 hours. I think they're open until about 5 o'clock in the morning. And this one is, uh, if you've got anybody that is really interested in shopping, likes women's fashion accessories, or they're looking for new shoes, or they just like looking around. Uh, this is one of the best places to go. There are about four or five buildings that and used to spill into the streets. They've kind of cleaned things up now, but it used to be a wholesale market. And so people from the provinces would come in and they'd buy entire bags full of things. They would bring it back on the buses and sell it within their local shops. So it's not just a wholesale market anymore. Um, these particular areas, it, each floor is dedicated for, it, for these buildings. Each floor is dedicated to a different type. So everything from shoes to... Uh, women's earrings to necklaces to so fashion accessories might be two floors. Um, women's uh, fashion in general might be another three floors, such so as clothing. Men usually get one floor just for shoes. Um, they've got again, it just there's so much of it that has to be had. And these are your up and coming designers typically that are having shops within these particular areas. And if you're looking for the more high end areas, of course you've got the Gangnam area as well but uh, very expensive district. So if you're looking for high end, just mention expensive. I know those tour operators know where to look. Common questions we get, who sells Korea and Canada? Uh, these are just a few of them. There's not all of them are listed here. Uh, we do have a number of operators that sell Korea, but the easiest way to look at it is if they sell Asia, they will sell Korea. If they customize, 100% they will sell Korea. So there are a number of operators up here that offer group packages, offer um, stopover packages, offer combination packages. That's a popular one too. So for example, Japan and Korea combined, China and Korea combined. The newest ones, of course, being Thailand and Korea combined. But there's a, a number of options in there for your clients. So how to sell Korea? Most importantly, why Korea? Why should you be looking at it? It's the add-on, the value uh, add that's for the client. You're giving them something that they didn't think about. They came to you and they said they wanted to buy a Vietnam package. So they bought a Vietnam package from you and you tried to sell them on um, the, that extra $1,500 or $500 or $800, whatever the price may be for that stopover package. Remember, it's additional commission for you, but they're getting a second destination that they didn't think about adding on that they're going to have to stop because of the airlift anyway. So give it a try. If you still fail in trying to upsell them, that's okay. Because they can still walk away with something that they wouldn't have had before. And that's the idea of the free transit tour. I see one comment from Paul that says he, uh, he did a free, uh, the free transit tours are great. He did two when he was on his eight hour stopover. Absolutely. You can book them in advance, but you don't have to. Uh, they're available on a first come first serve basis. So if, let's suppose that you booked one and you thought, oh, that was great, I want to do one more and I've got a little bit of time. I want to do, try that one-hour tempo tour that they were, Randy was talking about during the presentation. Uh, again, just go and make sure that you're hanging out near their free transit tours desk. Tell them that you're interested in uh, adding yourself on. About 20 minutes before departure, they'll come to you and they'll say, okay, we've got room on this particular one. It's not a full group. Come and join us on the bus. But uh, give them the option of the free transit tour. It works for you because they'll come back to you later. It's an idea that they hadn't had themselves. But it also works for us because the next time, that they're considering a destination. They say, oh, we had a great time on the transit tour. I'd really like to see what else Seoul has to offer or perhaps a second city or Korea in general. And they'll come back to you for that. Some of those areas that they, you can combine with, remember there's just so many areas in Asia that you can combine Korea with. 
is not just restricted to Japan and China. So that about covers today's presentation. For anybody who has any questions, you can certainly put them down the bottom in the Zoom webinar. I think we've got David still on the line. David, you there? Oh, hey there. That was great, Randy. Thanks so much. No, thank you. So of course, we'll open it up now to anyone that might have questions based on that. And once again, everyone, you can submit them to either the chat box or the Q&A box, and I can read them out to Randy. And uh, the first one that's been submitted is a question from Ruth, who asked, are there any temple stays in Seoul? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, there are. Um, it depends on the tour operator that you're using, of course, but yes, there are. Let me just go back to the slide of all our tour operators that's up here. Great. Uh, the Temple Stay experience, if I'm not mistaken, it is one that sits very, it's in the um, Kwangamun area. So it sits backing onto a hotel that is called Shilla Stay. Um, it's a very new area, but the temple, of course, is not so new. It's pretty old but it's a beautiful, beautiful area to go and visit. Um, and there is stuff that you can go and see outside, but there are two, one temple stay of the two temples that are in Seoul does offer the overnight stay. If your clients, and this is another thing to mention, if your clients are afraid to try that overnight stay, uh, there is an experience program that they offer for a three hour stay. So they get to go and do a small craft in the temple. And then usually they get some group on one time with a monk and they get to ask questions like, you know, how do you live? And, um, uh, how often do you do you meditate and questions like that and then they if you do request it they will offer to teach you how to meditate as well amazing thank you and uh randy the next submission wasn't a question but it was a comment from nadia yeah. who said thank you for the great presentation i appreciate the overview of the history and culture and i'm so ready to experience korea for myself this webinar was one of the best ones i've watched recently so thank you again no, thanks thank nadia. You, nadia much appreciated thank you very much nadia And again, uh, if anyone's having trouble finding the Q&A box, it's just found in the, uh, the black Zoom toolbar with the white icons. Just click on the uh, Q&A icon there. And uh, one has been submitted from Melissa who asked, what choices can the clients use to reach, their hot to reach, uh, to reach out to their hotels? What choices? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, let's see. What, ch what choices can the clients use to reach Oh, to reach their hotels, or maybe she meant to reach out to their hotels. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, for uh, transportation. Ah, transportation. Right. Okay. So that's a great question. I'm glad that you asked. So if your client is booking through any of the tour operators that you see on the screen that I had brought up before um, that shows all the tour operators in Canada sell Korea, more than likely your airport transfer is included. So your clients wouldn't need to worry about that. However, some clients like to find their own way for the first half and then the second half, you know, you book them as part of a package through one of these tour operators and that's fine too. There are a number of different ways to get downtown. The easiest one by far is Korean Air offers the Cal Limousine service. So if you look at the Cal Limousine service website, uh, just Google search Cal Limousine, it comes up with a number of different hotels and there are, is a fairly large list uh, I think it's only about 14,000 won, which runs to about, let's say, $16, $17 Canadian or so. Uh, and it will take them directly to their hotel. It drops them right out the front. And they do everything from three to four to five star hotels. Another thing is, if your client's uh, hotel is not on that particular website, and remember, it goes both ways. Uh, if your client is not, a uh, hotel is not on that particular website, take a look what a hotel is close to it so they can get off and walk. It's typically, it might just be a, a quick walk across the street or a block over, that type of thing. It's not typically very, very far. Uh, another option, not so popular on the arrival, more on the departure, is there is a subway that runs straight downtown if they're staying in Seoul. So the subway is connected to the airport as well. Uh, the other one would be there is a bus that runs to the surrounding provinces as well as to downtown. So they're fairly easy to take and they do drop off in all the major tourist areas as well. And then the last one is taxis. Now taxis, it's not a problem to take a taxi, but the cost can be a little bit higher than most people expect. Remember you're talking about a one hour drive or so from the airport to downtown Seoul, or when I say downtown north of the Han River, um, you're looking at about an hour. So that cost is about 65 to let's say $80 Canadian and up. It all depends on the level of traffic at the time. Perfect, yeah, perfect. Thanks, much covers it. Great. <laughs> and the next question here is, are there any good hiking options outside of Seoul? Wow, variety of questions today. That's great. 
uh, outside of Seoul, there are a lot. Uh, I'm going to go with the, what I say is the most extreme because I'm not a hiker. There are overnight hiking trails that go through Sorak Mountain, so one of the mountains on the east east area, just uh, east of Seoul. Uh, overnight, so when I say overnight, it's a one-night, two-day program, and you, I think you hike for a couple, I want to say a couple hours, and then they, you have to bring your own food with you. There's no food that can be purchased at that uh, at that particular rest stop, but it's a rest stop where you sleep overnight. Uh, very popular with Korean uh, Korean hikers. And hiking in Korea is very, very, very popular. And when I say very popular, I, I'm not exact. I'm not over exaggerating by any means. Um, they do have the full gear, so everything from the hiking poles to the the North Face jackets and the pants and everything. Um, a very, very popular thing for Koreans to do. But they'll they'll hike up the mountain uh, with their food for that particular night. They'll have Korean barbecue and they're very friendly people. So you learn a little bit about the hiking culture, especially once they have a, a little bit of soju. That's a very popular thing. You know, you've had a high day, a big day of uh, hiking and you get to the top of the mountain and you're spending your night and you're not quite at the very top, but you get the idea. Um, and they'll open a bottle of soju and they'll share it with the group. And they're always hiking in groups. Nobody ever hikes alone. Same thing. You never drink alone too. So you drink in a group. And so it's a great way to meet some new friends uh, and learn a little bit about the hiking culture of Korea. But for those who don't want to do the overnight, uh, there are a number of mountains. I think it's about 70% mountains, the whole country. Um, one of the more popular ones sits about, uh, it sits on the subway line, but it's only about a three to ha three and a half to four hour hike to the top. Um, but there are a lot of hiking options all around Seoul and the surrounding area. It just depends on how much time they really want to go for. Uh, if you have a question about specific names of mountains, we do have one particular person on our staff that's dedicated to answering agents and consumers' questions about certain areas, so they can do a little research for you. Just send me an email. My email is randy, R-A-N-D-Y, at K-N, as in Nathan, T-O, dot C-A. So once more, randy at K-N-T-O, dot C-A. We'd be happy to look them up for you and send you some responses so you can recommend to your clients for hiking as well. Amazing. Thanks, Randy. That's great. And the last question submitted here was from John, who had a very interesting question. He asks, are there any options for visiting North Korea while in South Korea? Ah, very good question. Uh, we run into that quite a bit, but unfortunately, no. Uh, one of the things that you do visit when you go to the DMZ tour is they will take you to Dorasan Station. This particular station is the last station on the subway slash train line that goes from the South Korea to the north. And when you get to that station as part of your tour, they show you all the, uh, immigra the immigration checkpoint that's set up, all the x-ray machines that are all ready to go um, for baggage, et cetera. The, uh, it's just, it looks like a mini airport built inside of a train station. And it shows that the South is ready. So if tomorrow, for example, that the train line were to open between the two countries, everybody or, would be ready for to accept those particular tours coming from the south and coming or coming from the north and of course those going to the uh, from the south to the north as well uh, but that's the only connection that is built and ready between the two countries or i should say the divided country but nothing right. is available across just yet um, there are some canadian tour offers that offer a korea north korea south korea package but that means that you have to fly from incheon into china and you would either fly again into or you would take a, um, a train into uh, North Korea. But it can't be done directly through South Korea, no. Not at this time. Okay, right. Very good to know. Thanks. And Louise says, great, great webinar. Thank you, Randy. Thank you very much, Louise. And Randy, do you, have, do you have time to answer one more question before we wrap up? Sure. Oh, great. Okay, so this, is, uh, this submission is also from John. He asks, is it possible to rent a car tour uh, to rent a car to tour Korea, would it be possible to obtain accommodations on the way? And are there bilingual, bilingual signs everywhere? Okay, a uh, variety of questions there. So I'll start with the first one. You need an international driver's license, of course. Uh, the rules of driving in Korea are exactly the same as here. Yes, you can rent a, a car in the airport. So in Incheon Airport or upon arrival, you can rent them. They do have uh, English navigation systems as well. So make sure that you request one of those, but it'll make it easier let's be honest it's a, a navigation even if you get a korean one that says turn right there'll be an arrow on the little navigation that shows pointing right in so many meters and they're very exact they even tell you where all the speed cameras are which is quite nice um, but that's it makes it very easy to get around uh, when it comes to your bilingual signage yes every road sign is listed in english and korean and this is where a lot of people may misunderstand when i say every road sign is translated 
uh, it'll say something along the name in Korean and it'll literally translate it into English. So let's suppose, I'll give an example of, I'll, I'll just make up a name of a road called Gyeongbok Palace Road um, or Gyeongbokgung Gil. They would actually write Gyeongbokgung Gil in English. So they would write G-Y-E-O-N-G-B-O-K-G-U-N-G-G-I-L. That's how they would actually write it on the signage. Oh, wow. So, it doesn't make it very easy to get around that way, but they have gone to a North American style address system. Uh, so it's given a street name and an address. So as long as you type that into your navigation system, you will be able to find yourself anywhere in the country very easily. And the last part of the question was hotel reservations. Uh, yeah, most hotels have availability at any time of year. Um, I would say, especially outside of Seoul, in Seoul can be a little bit sticky, of course, because there's a lot of international tourism. And of course, Busan can be a little bit difficult too, but any of the other smaller areas, it's not, it's not a problem. One thing that they want to watch out for though is um, uh, booking on the day of, uh, finding that, let's suppose that you pull into a city and you want to find a, uh, a hotel at the very last minute. They may find that the rates have gone up slightly because of the fact that they've done it last minute or they may find it a little bit difficult to find that particular hotel because it sits in the province uh, or in the, one of the provinces. It's, um, it, it, remember that when you're in very small communities, there may be only one hotel for the entire area. It's kind of like visiting um, Nipissing area. There aren't that many hotels in the Nipissing area, right? So it, it really depends on where they're going, but yes, it can be done. Uh, it's just a matter of pricing and whether they're willing to pay that uh, a little premium and the premium doesn't always cost out that much more. Sometimes it's only a 10 to 20% range. Excellent. Well, I do believe that's it for the questions. There are none submitted here. So that, uh, that wraps up all of them. Thanks so much, Randy. Thanks very much. I appreciate everybody's time. So I'd definitely like to thank everybody that tuned in the webinar today. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your day. And Randy, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. That was very informative and it was great having you. It was great being here. Thanks very much, everyone. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye, Randy. Take care. Bye. Oh, and once again, to everyone that might have signed in late, uh, the recording of this webinar will be made available on the Baxter Media YouTube channel tomorrow afternoon. So if you uh, search for Baxter Media on YouTube, our, our YouTube channel is very easy to find, and that's where our webinars are, are uh, archived. So thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.